Our final witness for the day, Christina Green, uh, Chief Advancement External Relations Officer for the Children's Advocacy Center of Texas. Thank you, I'm Christina Green. I am the Chief Advancement and External Relations Officer at the Children's Advocacy Centers of Texas, and we are the membership association for all 70 Children's Advocacy Centers, or CACs, in the state, as well as leading the charge to prevent child sexual abuse in Texas. Our CACs are codified in the Texas Family Code and required statutorily to facilitate joint investigations in crimes against children cases and provide core services such as forensic interviews, forensic medical exams, counseling and mental health services, comprehensive case management, case coordination with our investigatory partners in prosecution, law enforcement, and the Department of Family and Protective Services, and regular case review with those partners. We serve over 60,000 new children every year with the majority of those cases being child sexual abuse cases. So it is not hyperbole to say that we are the expert in response to child sexual abuse in the state as well as the dynamics of child sexual abuse and recovery services related to this issue as well. As you've heard a lot throughout this hearing, and thank you so much to the incredibly brave and courageous survivors that testified before our panel, um, this is a crime of secrecy. And the dynamics of child sexual abuse are very important to understand in order to figure out where those holes are and where improvements need to be made to make sure that Texas is the safest and best state for children to be children. So you heard some uh, data about the prevalence. Um, up until the last two years, we did not have prevalence data for the state of Texas for child sexual abuse. CAC Texas worked with the Department of State Health Services and the CDC to gain that information. Nationally, it is one in 10 children. In Texas, it is one in six <clears throat> children before their 18th birthday will be sexually abused. And that is at the hands of an adult or another minor. And in the majority of those cases, up to 90% in general, and 98% in the 60,000 cases we see every year, the perpetrator is someone the child knows, trusts, and likely loves. Mm -hmm. And you've heard that in all of the, the testimony that you've heard today. We're talking about family members, coaches, pastors, teachers, all of these people in these environments where we should be keeping children safe. But again, this is a crime of secrecy. And so in that secrecy, that is where the shame festers and the opportunity festers for repeated victimization. So we have to make sure in this discussion and every discussion, we are acknowledging that just having this conversation is a step in the right direction. And I want to commend this committee for spending so much time and engaging with these panels on this issue because this is an excellent step towards taking this issue out of the shadows and into the light. In doing so, um, we know that with these NDAs, we don't know the prevalence because people can't talk about them. Um, and so in order to make sure that we are not reinforcing the crime, the crime secrecy and shame and stunting or preventing healing and preventing and disrupting the investigation of these cases, we do need to continue to address this issue as the committee has been discussing all day long. But we also need to make sure that the abuse is being reported, because if it's not reported, it cannot be investigated, and we cannot hold these perpetrators accountable. And that is a huge um, piece that we have to highlight, that just because the issue is recognized, and we do also know that three out of every five victims will not tell about the abuse. So we are seeing the majority of cases in Texas. We still have a gap of cases that we're not seeing, um, but those are only the reported cases that are coming into law enforcement or the Department of Family and Protective Services. So there's a substantial gap, and it is the bravery and courage of survivors, like you heard from, speaking out that encourages others to come forward, and they can't do that with NDAs. Additionally, it's normalizing that we have a system in Texas that responds effectively when survivors do come forward. And the worst thing that we believe can happen is a survivor speaks out and there's no one there to catch them. Mm. And in Texas, you all have invested in this Children's Advocacy Center model where that case is mandated to come to a Children's Advocacy Center. And we make sure we facilitate that joint investigation with law enforcement and prosecution and DFPS so no one is slipping through the cracks. So information is being shared. We're making sure if there are registry lists, those alleged perpetrators are being held accountable and then being put on those lists as well. But again, for that process to work, we have to make sure that the case is called in, reported, and investigated. 
that multidisciplinary process runs on exposing that secrecy. So we make sure when a child comes into our centers, they know what they're there for. We take them into the forensic interview room and the forensic interviewer at the CAC shows them where the microphone is, they show them where the camera is, and they let them know who is watching the interview. Because from the start, we want them to know this is a safe place and where your story is going to be told, how is it, how it is going to be used, because they have ownership over that story. That is their life, that is their narrative. And then when we go on into the recovery services and our mental health therapy, which is provided free of charge, which is another reason why we have to get children in the doors, because in order for them to access those services and not feel like they don't have the ability to seek out these services because of payment or other barriers, um, they process through this trauma. And as Elizabeth said, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, or TFCBT, is the gold standard in these cases. And a large part of that, um, that modality of mental health therapy is the child telling and reprocessing their story in a way that gives them ownership of it so that it's not controlling them, that they are then in control. And so all of these reasons are how the child both gets safety, justice, and healing by walking through that entire process from the investigation through therapy. It also involves public safety and prevention of child sexual abuse, as you've also heard. We cannot hold these offenders accountable unless the child and family are engaged in the process. And our comprehensive case management keeps them engaged in that process from start to finish so that our investigatory partners have the information they need to hold these perpetrators accountable. If we have silenced our victims and potentially covered up crimes that are almost always an offense in the Texas Penal Code, a felony offense, um, then we are reinforcing the secrecy and we know that these perpetrators very rarely have only one victim. So they are going to victimize multiple children and likely re-victimize their initial victims. So we have to make sure we're holding them accountable and reinforcing that public safety dynamic. Additionally, if we're keeping these case is silenced, we are not empowering parents and communities to protect their children if they don't know who the perpetrators are in their community, in their, their institutions, or in their neighborhoods. Secrets are toxic in these cases. And one of the things that we tell parents and caregivers and people with children in their lives, a good way to prevent child sexual abuse is to never have secrets. Surprises are okay, but no secrets ever. And if you have a child in your life, I hope today that you will internalize that and make that part of your practice as well. As well. This legislature and the state, as you've said, Chairman Leach, has chosen time and time again to prioritize victims of child sexual abuse. And this is seen through our mandatory reporting statutes and the requirements around that. And in those cases um, that you heard before today, all of those people who knew about that were required to report. We are all mandatory reporters. And um, there are penalties for failure to report, but they are class A misdemeanors. Um, and if you're a professional and not reporting, it's a state jail felony if you have an intent to conceal. We've also established and enshrined CACs in our entire process of how we work child sexual abuse cases, and we are a leader in the nation in that response. And we hope to continue to partner with the legislature to grow that, to make sure that we are reaching every single child that not only requires, but deserves this approach, and making sure it's consistent and standardized from El Paso all the way to Beaumont. We also want to make sure that we're working with you all to hold offenders accountable in settings where children are in institutions and schools. And so that's definitely an area where we want to make sure that we're shoring up those loopholes and those gaps because offenders do know where those gaps are. So thank you for taking a look at this issue. Um, we don't tolerate child sexual abuse in this state and we won't tolerate it in this state. And we wanna make sure that we are here to support those child victims from the time that it happens to the prosecution of these cases. And we hope to continue to work with you all to shore up all of our public policy to make sure that we're doing that to the best of our ability from the top down and continuing to find areas where we can improve and areas where we can work to prevent this from ever happening in the first place because that is the ultimate goal because we cannot investigate and we cannot prosecute our ways out of this. We have to find ways to prevent this from ever happening at the start. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Do you feel like most Texans know that they're mandatory reporters? That's a great question. Um, we actually just uh, did some groundbreaking research around prevention and attitudes about prevention um, across the state and surveyed thousands of Texans around attitudes and knowledge about child sexual abuse. And one of the questions we asked them was, do you know how to report and would you know where to go? Do you know that there's a child abuse hotline? And most people said, I don't, but I guess I would Google it. So um, 
As far as knowing if they're mandatory reporters, I highly doubt the most of Texans know they're mandatory reporters if they're not well aware of the child abuse hotline. So we do have um, some ways to go in letting folks know that this is this is the way that you have to proceed. And I will say, as someone who's worked in this field for over a decade and is an expert on this topic, I have encountered times in my life where I'm like, oh gosh, this seems like something, but like, is it enough to pick up the phone? And that is what DFPS and law enforcement are there to sort out. That is not for me to decide. That is not for anyone else to decide. And so we do need to find better ways of communicating that. Um, we work very closely with TEA to communicate that to our uh, school professionals, particularly because in institutions, um, and I think the testimony that you heard is outstanding of the just the way that the Catholic Church in the United States is institutionalizing that this is a priority to respond to and how to respond to it, that is not the case. There's a lot of concern about risk and liability, and that sometimes ends up with people not reporting, or if they bring up a suspicion, being discouraged to report. And that is still happening in some of our schools. And we have to figure out how to get around that because, again, that is prohibiting that child from seeking safety, justice, and healing, and then we are impacting other potential victims in the future as well negatively. Sure. I think we ought to think about doing a, a campaign in the state to to advertise to Texans that, to communicate to Texans that they are mandatory reporters. We, we do it. We've done a lot of good work in human trafficking. Yep. There's a lot that, that we've put behind that. I mean, heck, we, if we can advertise the Texas lottery and how people should play the lottery, <laughs> then we should advertise how people are mandatory reporters. Mr. Chairman, I was thinking the exact same thing, and it might also have the salutary effect of letting victims out there know sure. that there are people and there's an organization and there's structure that cares about it, and you might actually get more people coming forward yeah. when they know there's a safety net out there. Yeah, well, if we look at point. an issue like breast cancer, for instance, which we did not talk about sure. at all sure. just not even two decades ago, right, because it involved female anatomy. Now it is regular to talk, it is normal to talk about breast cancer and breast cancer screenings and talking to fellow women about are you getting your mammogram starting at age 40 or 45? And we need to make this an issue that is not something that's shameful to talk about. We need to be able to equip caregivers and institutions with, so it's, it is, uh, it is um, a campaign and also it's bigger than that. It is social change and making sure that we're taking this issue and making it an issue that we can talk about just as we have today. And it is a hard issue, but the more that we talk about it, the more it becomes institutionalized in everyday um, communication. And an example of that is if you have a child that is going over to play at someone's house, do you know who's in that home? Hmm. Do you know if there are one-on-one -on -one interactions that will not be monitored or interruptible? Those are things that we need to equip caregivers with. But if you're a caregiver, think about how uncomfortable that would make you to ask those questions. But if True. all of the parents are aware of that and are asking the questions, it's like asking, is there a pool in your backyard? Do you, are you cutting up the food? Um, so as we're going to our pediatrician checkup visits, is that included on the sheets that parents are getting mm -hmm. on these milestone checkups? It's not right now, but it needs to be. And that's something that we're working with both the medical community and other professionals because in those surveys, parents and caregivers said the people that they want to hear this information from are their medical professionals. Mm. That's who they trust. That's how we got car seats to become the norm. And so how do we look at these other societal issues that we have had to have major social change on, learn from that, and then start to chip away at it? And it's not going to be overnight, but if we don't start now, we are doing a complete disservice to the children today and in the future and ultimately to our state because those are our future adults and leaders of this state. Yeah, it's well said. said yeah, One last question. We've, we've talked about the, the current situation a lot today, and we act as if sort of there's some sort of increase. And I don't, <clears throat> do we have any way of knowing, is there really an increase or are people just becoming aware of it? I mean, we all, we all are told, hey, when I was a kid, we could ride our bike, we could yeah. go anywhere. You know, I mean, sex hasn't changed sort of deviant desires probably haven't changed much over the centuries. Mm -hmm. Do we have any, is there any, obviously there's been a lot of research, is there any reason to believe it's gotten worse or is it just easier to hide now? 
That's a great question. So as I said earlier, we've not had baseline prevalence data in the state of Texas until the last two years. So that is why we work with the Department of State Health Services and the CDC to start to gain that baseline data so we can actually measure it over time and measure the our prevention efforts too, because we want to make sure if we're sinking resources, time, and efforts into prevention, is it working? And can we measure it? And that's a good way to measure it. Um, as far as has the prevalence increased, the way that it's facilitated has gotten a lot easier with tools like apps, social media, and the internet. Whether or not it's increased, that depends on which type of sexual abuse you're looking at. If we talk about child sexual abuse imagery and online sexual abuse, absolutely that has increased. Um, as far as what's reported, it does fluctuate. Um, nationally, instances and reports of rape are down, and that's federally coming out from the FBI through the national um, incident-based reporting system data that Texas reports up into. Um, in the past year, in fiscal year, I believe 23 or 24, DFPS reports um, for child sexual abuse were down 13%, but it fluctuates. It changes year over year. We look at that and we track that. And in fact, we look at how many children we serve annually, but we also look at how many cases are coming in and being assigned for investigation at DFPS compared to what we we are actually seeing come through our doors. So we kind of have to look at both the breadth of what's coming in for investigation and what we're seeing versus what in totality we believe is out there because it does fluctuate as to what's reported. But again, it's a crime of secrecy, so we only know what's reported. So that's why we're really looking at this um, incidence data of one in six children because that is a confidential report that high school students are filling out. Um, and so that is something year over year we will measure. We should be getting our next round of data in the next um, year or so. So we'll continue to report out to you all on that to measure it to see if it is actually increasing or decreasing. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, members, any other questions? Okay, Christina, thank you. Thank Jennifer, you. thank you as well. Um, it's a great discussion.